äh, wird uns hier ein paar Erläuterungen geben. Herzlich willkommen, Bob, das erste Mal in Erkrad, aber häufig in Deutsch. Sprichst du in Deutschland? Sprichst du ganz gut Deutsch? Englischer Vortrag, deutscher Vortrag? Überwiegend Englisch. Ja, das kann best. Das ist kein Problem. Ach, meine Damen und Herren. Herzlich willkommen in. Du heißt dieses Wort? Erkhardt. Ja, meine Kenntnis von der deutschen Sprache ist ein bisschen begrenzt. Sagen Sie es auch in Englisch, okay? Ja. Gut. Okay, Aerials. The first thing I'm usually asked about when I talk about aerials is how do aerials work? It's a very good question mm -hmm. because nobody really knows. But the theory is that they work on a thing called remnants. That's a nice word, remnants. And what does remnants mean? If we go back to simple electrical theory, I take a conductor, I apply a voltage across it, current will flow through it and there will be a magnetic field formed around this conductor. At the top, it will be north, at the bottom, it will be south, or perhaps the other way around. If I put an alternating power onto this, that will say the power is going this way, and that way, and this way, and that way, the north will go, the top part will go north, south, north, south, the bottom part will go south, north, south, north. No problem, until we get to a higher frequency. When we reach a higher frequency, the northern, the top part will be told at a certain moment to go north. While it's in the process of going north, it'll get a further signal behind it, if you like, a kick up the backside, saying, go south. What will happen then? There'll be a kind of an explosion. And a large area, a large part of magnetic field will be blown into the atmosphere. That is radiated in the form of, ele of electromagnetic power and also electrostatic power. That is the basic principle of how an aerial works. At least, that is what we believe. <laughs> when designing an aerial, the first thing is, who is going to listen to it? Are we going to broadcast to the people in our local area? That's normally the way we work. Or are we going to broadcast to people in foreign countries? In other words, do we want our signal to go along the ground to the people all around us in the local neighborhood? Or do we want to go into the sky to places further away. As a rule, we want to broadcast to our own neighbourhoods, to the people around us. So, that would normally apply, it would normally mean a vertical antenna. Now, if I take a vertical antenna, this is the ground, put a vertical antenna on it, the radio signal will leave more or less in this pattern, in both directions. If, on the other hand, I put a sloping antenna on, it will tend to go more upwards. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But for the time being, we'll talk about an aerial working this way, a vertical aerial. Um, now, how does one construct a vertical aerial? First thing we have to do is get a good ground net. And we'll say, under the aerial, because, an aerial, because the signal from an aerial goes not only through the air, it tends to go out like this, and come back through the ground. It goes out, through the air, and back through the ground. In both directions, continually. So it's important to get a good ground. Now, we can't influence the ground 10 kilometers further up, but we can influence the ground under our aerial, by putting lots and lots of wires under the ground. Not too deep under the ground. In fact, you can lay them on the ground. But the problem is, if you lay them on the ground, one morning you're going to go there and they'll be gone because they're made of copper and copper is worth money. So normally they're buried just a little bit under the ground, so far under the ground, which also means that a farmer, if he's using the land around it, can still plough it and use it to grow his crops. Otherwise, it means you've got to, to rent a very large piece of ground. And that's not a good idea. Okay. Um, there's something else that we have to do in a mast. It's always at the bottom of the mast, put a heavy earthing rod into the ground. The idea of that is that if should, should lightning strike our mast, it will immediately go down to the ground and cause no damage to the mast. Now, let's look at the 
Clarence Flynn through Nero. What is important is the length of the arrow, the height of the arrow. And the height is, is related to the wavelength. We used to speak in old days of Caroline on 259. It was 259 meters. In those days, we spoke about meters. That meant the length of a radio wave, in the case of Caroline, was 259 meters. Well, let's call it 260. That's easy. 260 meters. We had to be related to that. But a mass of 260 meters cost an awful lot of money. Now, there are many places we can't even build one. If you're close to an airport, whatever, forget it. You won't get away with it. But it doesn't have to be that high. It can be, good, it can be less high than that. But suppose we have a very short area. Say an aerial of, well, only 10 meters. Now, I can make that resonate. I can even make this resonate. But it won't be very efficient. The problem with a short aerial is it will tend to send mostly into the sky. Which is not what we want. We want people down here to listen to us. If we make the air a little bit longer, well, then we get a pattern a bit more like this. It's, it's, it's spreading out a bit more over the ground. No, that was the next one. <laughs> um, but of course, another practical limitation in building an aerial is if we have a really good mass, a really high one, it has to be fixed to the ground. Which means it takes up more space. Which means it costs you more money. So we have to find, if you like, a place in the middle. It's not too expensive, not too tall, but not too short. The ideal aerial, in fact, is a five-quarter wavelength. That will be five quarters of in this case, 260 meters. <coughs> that is an ideal theoretical length for an area. Because, in this point, the current at the top will be greater than with a shorter area. A shorter area will look more like this. If it's five quarters of the wavelength, we'll have something like this, which will go up quite nicely. That will be quite efficient. Actually, I said five quarters of 260 meters is actually a fraction less than that because the area has a thickness. An ideal aerial would have no thickness at all, but only length. But of course, it's quite impossible to make that. Um, on the other hand, it's sometimes not possible to go to five quarters. There's no money for it. So we can get around that by putting a shorter aerial. Let's say this one is three eighths. It's too short, we're going to get this kind of pattern. The idea is how can we get more current to go up there? The current here is theoretically zero because there's nowhere it can go. Here, it can go higher. But up there, there's nothing for it to go to. So we create something for it to go to. We can put a star on here. And what happens with that star? This star forms a capacitor. So power flows up the mast, into the star, and through the star, back to Earth. That increases the efficiency of the aerial. In fact, at any time, if you see an aerial with a top on it, that means it's actually too short. It should have been longer. But again, that saves money. Oh yes. The there was another technique that was an anti-fading aerial. Five quarter wavelength is usually referred to as an anti-fading aerial. When it's an anti-fading, I think we've all listened in the old days to Radio Luxembourg. The problem with Radio Luxembourg was if it isn't on medium wave, you used to get nasty distortions. And the reason for that is that Radio Luxembourg, despite its efficient aerial, did send partly into the air. And after dark, it sent some partly into the sky. And after dark, you had the signal going on the ground. And after dark, the signal came back from the sky. And if you lived here, you would receive a signal across the, from the ground. And also a signal from the sky. The signal from the sky, because it had traveled a longer distance, we received it later than the signal on land. 
and they're both varying in power all the time. Sometimes the signal along the ground is stronger than the signal through the air, sometimes the other way around. And you have these horrible ubergangen, I don't know, because I can't say the word in English, where there'd be a change between the signal from the sky coming in and the signal from the ground coming in. You get a nasty distortion. Sometimes they even cancel, you get nothing at all. The anti-fading antenna was designed to have as little possible sky wave. Another technique which the BBC used years ago was to have a transformer and have a mast actually split in two. An insulator was, an insulator was put in there. And they had a, set, a clever system of transformers. <laughs> they could send a signal into there. Now, if you make this thing work, set, send a signal into there. And with a delay, send another signal into there. And that worked quite well, except that the coils were difficult in those days to make and weren't terribly efficient. But it was a good experiment, and in theory, it did work. Now, how are we going to feed our aerial? It's all real talking about aerials, but we've got to get a signal up there somehow. A transmitter will have an output of, shall we say, 50 ohms in beams, typically 50 ohms. But I've never seen a mast which had 50 ohms in beams. We have to try and find a place on our mast where we're roughly near 50 ohms. We can shunt feed the mast. Really, no city, this is the Nipo 2. You send a signal up to, it's never halfway up the mast, could be halfway up the mast, but usually it's a little bit less than a third, or perhaps even two thirds. Send a signal up there, this point will be, well, a reasonably high mm. ohms value, as high as possible. Put a signal in there, usually get quite an effective result. The problem with this is if you look down on it vertically, north, south, west, and east, this is a aerial. If this is on the eastern side, there will be a little hole in it. There. This also was noticeable on some of the sea ships, some of the radio ships. Every radio ship, in the morning it turned, when the tide, well, once a day it turned, when the tide turned, and once again later on it turned back when the tide turned. Some of the radio ships, you could hear this point going round. When the tide changed from the day tide to the high tide to the low tide, the ship slowly turned, and you could hear this point going round. Or if you had a meter, an S meter, you could actually see it dipping a little while, until this part had gone back round. By the way, if there's a dip here, there'll also be a slight bump there, but that's really nitty. Uh, no, this is... Okay, top loading we've had, the five quarter aerial we've had. Um, Another efficient way of feeding a mast is base loading it. That's to say, we put an insulator at the bottom. So it's not connected to the ground here at all. We send our signal in with the transmitter at the bottom. Again, possibly if it's too short, put some top on it. This works quite efficiently, works very efficiently in fact, but the problem is it's rather susceptible in some places to lightning. And if lightning strikes this, well, the lightning is liable to go straight into the transmitter and destroy it. Now, there is a trick of putting a spark gap down here and hope that lightning will go across it. Usually it does. But if it doesn't, you've got a problem. This is something you can use from time to time. Radio Caroline uses once at, at, at sea, which I thought was very risky because at sea, a radio ship gets a lot of lightning. Nevertheless, it worked quite well for us. Another system is the Unibol. In this case, we have our mast, which is earthed. And we have a piece of wire, like this, which goes to the insulator, and we put our signal in here. This is a folded aerial. So it goes up and around and down. A variation of this, an efficient variation, because this also has a slightly directional effect, the variation of this is to make a cage. And if it's a three-sided mast, well, of course, you'll have a three-sided cage. And that works rather well. Signal so going up, coming back down again. But then again, dependent upon the frequency. And if you've been unfortunate enough to inherit a mast, which wasn't made for your frequency, then you might have a problem as well. Another technique, which is used, is T aerial. Ready ever wrong to use this system. 
you have a relatively short aerial, a relatively short piece of rubber, fed at the bottom, signal over there, and we have a large amount of top loading like this at the top. In fact, Radio Veronica is a good example of this. It doesn't work terribly well. You obviously have to support this. It doesn't hang up in the sky by itself. <laughs> it has to be supported by a pole or a mast. And Radio Veronica were lucky they had two wooden masts. So the wooden mast did not affect the radiation of this. If you have here a steel mast, and of course the steel mast is going to take a lot of your signal straight back down to Earth again. And it won't get out very well. That, by the way, is the reason. <coughs> As a rule, if you look at a medium wave aerial mast, <coughs> this is the mast, however it's fixed to the whatever, it doesn't really matter. Um, you usually see insulators here in the, in the state wise. Mm -hmm. The idea of the insulators is to break up the state cables to make them, as it were, invisible to the radio signal. If that was a continual cable, again, the signal would go up the mast, straight back down to Earth again, and if you stood here, you wouldn't hear it. That's the case of the lobbies. Um, now, oh yes, now the last thing I'm going to have on this time is the inverted V. The inverted V is deliberately intended for sending signals away. The idea is to send a signal, not to your local neighbourhood, but to send it to the neighbours, further away. Mm -hmm. Send a signal from here to, well, to Holland or to Sheffield. You have a wooden mask, well wooden, I've pencilled it in, it has no electronic value at all, it's nothing more than a support. We have a cable for the insulator here, going up, and going down, and insulated here, and we feed it at one end. This tends to send a signal up into the sky. When it's got up into the sky, depending on the frequency and depending upon the time of day, whether it's day or night, it will come back down again to Earth. And it can come down maybe 2,000 kilometers further away. And if you've got friends and neighbors there that you want to talk to, well, that's the way to do it. I don't think it's terribly technical. Just want to give you a general idea of how aerials work. We'll shortly look at, shortly look at some of uh, Peter Messico's photos, which are very, very good. There's one last development I want to talk to you about, very briefly. But it's the antenna technology in the last, I think I can fairly say, 100 years, has scarcely changed at all. We've got new materials, new kinds of plastics, new kinds of insulators, better kinds of conductors. But the basic theory has hardly changed. And, and types of aerials being built now are very much the same as aerials which were built 100 years ago. With one exception. There is a wonderful thing called the cross field aerial. I have read about this, I've never seen one. I've read the theory of it, I've seen the formulas on which it is based. And I can honestly say, I do not understand a word of it. <laughs> You're not the only one. <laughs> I do not understand a word of it. To me, it is impossible, but certain people have promised that it does work. Now, a colleague of mine has built a model of one with a computer program which he designed himself. And with a scale model of an aerial, he can, in fact, largely test it. And he was doing it the last time I saw him. And I would strongly recommend to you, Jan, to invite that person here next year to carry on where I leave off. His name is Peter Chicago. Okay. I can give you his telephone. <laughs> now we'll look at the photographs. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. We all know that there is a cross-field antenna somewhere in Egypt, and there is a cross-field antenna probably some miles off the Isle of Man in a future project in planning. So, uh, but. Egypt, I don't know, is it a radio broadcasting or is it a point-to-point uh, -point thing where it is operated? We don't know, but well, there I, are really not too many examples of this kind of stuff. I understand there are several in Egypt. One of the designers was an Egyptian, uh, which is rather strange because you don't think of Egyptians as being clever physicists. But, all right, I'll leave that in the middle. Um, Maybe you must put a pyramid around it. Well, <laughs> yeah, the problem is that what is important for an aerial is the efficiency. 
I mean, as I said earlier, I can make this radiate. I can, I can put a signal into this, you can probably hear it maybe here. Well, not there. It's a question of efficiency. How much you put into an aerial, how much comes out. Um, a sensible aerial can be 80%, maybe if you're very lucky, more than 80% efficient. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows how efficient the cross-field aerial is. There is inspectors have been to look at them, they've able to been able to measure, yes, a signal is coming out of it. But when they ask the people who are running it, how much signal are you putting into it? They can't give an answer or will not give an answer. That's the whole question. And there was one in Italy until fairly recently. It's now been taken out of commission. I don't know why. And uh, there was talk of one in France. There is one being constructed at the moment on the Isle of Man. I sincerely hope it works for them. Mm. But then again, I will be neutral. I've never seen one. I don't understand it. We'll have to suck it and see. The point raised with the speech of Dennis King concerning uh, radio projects, maybe on medium wave, does they have a future and so on. Yeah. So um, many people have um, do not do not like medium wave because of the audio quality. Now we have audio processors and these things which improve audio quality, mm -hmm. but does the aerial system and the design and the bandwidth of an aerial affect audio quality for the listener? Yeah, well something I didn't talk about was bandwidth. <laughs> and I didn't go into the, into the long wave theory. The problem is you have a low frequency. Supposing you have a frequency of, of 180 kilohertz and you want to modulate it with 18 kilohertz, that's 10% bandwidth on both sides. And most aerials can't handle that unless you make them physically very large. And make them physically large, they become less efficient. But then again, with medium wave, there are less and less stations on the air now than a medium wave. Every day a station closes down on a medium wave. Which leads me to say, in the future, instead of having the 9 kilohertz apart, why can't we put them 18 kilohertz apart? Then you've got a sensible audio spe spectrum. It's not enough for stereo, but it's enough for nice, for nice mono audio. And then perhaps we could say, okay, medium wave, let's go on to medium wave FM. Mm -hmm. Why should they be medium wave FM? There's no reason why they shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Or right, again, you've got the bandwidth problem. But so supposing you could say, well, uh, uh, with also, dual online, uh, online inbound, the online inbound system being developed in America, that also uses quite a lot, quite a broad bandwidth. Mm -hmm. But if you've only, say, you've got 10 stations in a country, why shouldn't it be done? And let's face it, with modern te techniques, if you listen, for example, to, well, I'm not sure about the new Radio 10, but the old Radio 10 on 6, 7, and 5, well, I wrote on 6, 7, and 5. It sounds, sounds quite nice. And also play, as Dennis said, play on the nostalgia of it. It doesn't, work in, it doesn't work in Germany, but it does work in the Netherlands. And it certainly works in Britain. It does we, a lot of business in Britain. Yeah, the British work. people grew up with, uh, <coughs> with, 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 with uh, medium wave. Mm -hmm. Britain had no FM. Not until, uh, I, I never heard of FM until I was about, uh, about 16. Germany, strangely enough, had the advantage of the war, that after the war Germany began with nothing. And the German government was clever enough to say, clever enough to say, right, we'll now start with a, with a clean sheet. Our entire broadcasting system has been destroyed. We have to build a new one. So it's immediately build a modern one. And that's why people of your age in Germany have grown up with FM. People of my age in Britain grew up with old-fashioned AM. In fact, as a child, when I used to go to the seaside, in the places around where these pirate stations used to be moored, up until the middle 60s, up until the late 60s, I think, begin 70s. You couldn't receive radio. You couldn't receive BBC on the medium wave. You had to go to the long wave. And if you're talking about poor quality, long wave was poor quality. But we grew up with it, and I think back to it with nostalgia. And that's something else you can sell to people, but not in Germany. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> um, the deep legs up. You have the ability, I don't know when this system was developed and used the first time, that you have one aerial mast and you feed it with two transmitters, yeah. completely different frequency yeah, into yeah. one system and not each other is blowing the yeah, other one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a miracle to me. Uh, no, it's not a miracle. Um, it's really not terribly difficult in principle. I saw a station in the southeast of England quite recently, and I believe it has four signals on it. It has four BBC stations. It's a simple T aerial, and there's a huge black box under it, 
It's simply a question of making filters so that the one signal doesn't get back into the other transmitter. But it's extremely tricky to set up because you have to adjust, for example, your one transmitter, adjust the second transmitter, which detunes the first one, then you go back to the first one to set the second one, and the third one gets its turn. It can take an awfully long time to get it right. But it can be done, and it works quite efficiently if it's done properly. But it's tricky. But the invention of that thing in front of you, the computer, has made it an awful lot easier. It can be done, it's not a miracle. And uh, influencing on, on the modulation, each other? Well, again, if, if the bandwidth isn't a problem, something else which is also very important is the frequencies shouldn't be related. If, for example, you have, um, should we say, one frequency, one signal on, should we say, 600 kilohertz and one on 1200 kilohertz, now you can have a problem, they can yes. interfere with each other. If one is on 600 and the other one is on, say, 970, you won't have a problem there. Okay. I might, must, by the way, mention there is uh, a radio station uh, on the east coast of England, at least the East or was until recently, it's a BBC station, and they run on 648 and 1296, and, yes. and they both use the same aerial. Mm -hmm. But there are two aerials for 648, and if they're on together, they use two different aerials. <laughs> That's worth saying. Okay, let's have a look maybe to the pictures. Radio 270, is there something to say? This is a, a, a mast with a... Um, well, it's a vertical mast. I can't see from that how it's... I think this is the same one. This one is... <coughs> is a, looks like a union pole, because this is what we used to call a sausage, or washed. This, in fact, mm -hmm. is the other one. The signal is going up there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. coming down here, in both directions. That gives a slightly higher impedance. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't know what frequency this was. I don't know why the, why the agent chose that, but it probably measured the mass and found that was the best around. 270. It was radio 270. Yeah. 270 was... Uh, how many kilohertz? 1,015. 1,015. And again, I don't know how, how high the mass was. It's something which the engineer has to work out. But it is a good construction of a mast. It's just a tube. It's a mast, again, which has very little thickness only length. Mm. Now these things you'll have to forget, these look like FM, American FM multi-directional antennas, but this gives an idea of how you can make a top-loaded T-aerial. Yeah. It's got plenty of width, mm. that's good for bandwidth. But this was our Chiba, no, our uh, oh, bot, yeah. my bot was, listen, was able to be right here, our Chiba, not the one on the medium mm. wave, from, from Israel, not mm. from Yugoslavia, right, it was similar. Yes, again, that's the other end of it, when I look at it. Um, no, well, it's, oh, that's an anemometer, that's not an area, that's for measuring the speed of the wind. Um, these are probably communicate, this is probably communication dipole, these are, this is also communication, that is probably an FM broadcasting transmitter, this thing here. But this gives an idea of how the top loading can work. Sometimes they're also joined at various places to make a kind of a net. But that's a huge bandwidth and plenty of top. Yeah, well, this is a very strange thing. Uh, this is the King David, and all I know about the King David was that it's, uh, a man must lost a leg on it, but that wasn't due to the aerial. Um, it's, I think, I've never seen it. Nobody ever will anymore, it's been destroyed. I think this is what we used to call a maypole aerial, and this was designed, broadly, for broadcasting into the sky. I don't understand that. I thought it was a touch station. But they claim they claim that it was this was a really important villa for sharing. But it was a pan-European station. They wanted to cover whole Europe. Well, it was stupid because there's no way of marketing that. And apart from putting it on a ship as the ship starts rocking around, that's going to go completely crazy. The man who designed that. He might have been a good radio man, but he'd never been in the ship before. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it was a mi uh, military design of, of uh, a special area, mm -hmm. and they brought it, uh, a flight here onto the, the ship. Uh, ah, well, an okay. another problem is, if, for example, the tender comes alongside. Yes. <laughs> you know what's going to happen when the tender comes alongside? 
This is uh, the communicator. Where's the communicator? Okay, that's a good example of a top video. Unfortunately, <coughs> this is a steel mast, which is going to make a hole in the signal going this way. That's a steel mast, going to make a hole in the signal going that way. But again, it's, it's a it's a T fed area. T area fed from, I would imagine, in there. That's probably the insulator. Mm -hmm. It's here, mm -hmm. on the sea. Mm -hmm. It was a four that. Oh, it's folded. Folded. Yes, it's it's folded. folded. It's the maximum length. So it's starts down and then it goes with four wires. With five wires all, all over and folded. I see it there, just squares. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. She's got there. Yeah. Yes. there. And then and it, it stops. Oh, it yeah, well, it's folded. Last. In that case, it's an L aerial, which again is top fed. Because this is more or less the vertical part. It looks like it's it could even it could even be two separate areas. Could even be two separate. It's not it's not clear to me from the photograph. Mm -hmm. It's not clear at all. Mm -hmm. Well, whatever. And this uh, oh that's another photograph of the same thing. <laughs> yeah, it seems to it's, it is flat here from the end, yeah. And it would look like it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is a, simply a construction to make the, the maximum length on board. Well, oh, make the maximum the length, but most of it is, is, is the top. But what I don't see, what I don't understand... Oh, now I can understand. I thought it was yeah, this is clear here. These bars mm -hmm. are simply to hold the four wires apart yes. to, make, mm -hmm. yeah. to increase the, the, the bandwidth. On the other photograph, they looked as if they were in the middle. Mm -hmm. That was the confusing thing. So in fact, it's more or less an L area. I can't see it from here. Well, let's take it as an L aerial. Mm. Vertical signal and a top. Mm. The variation, in fact, of a T. Now, this, now these are stay wires which have been earthed, been bolted onto the, well, mm. these are stays for holding up something, and they've been connected to the ship to earth them. Otherwise, if you touch one of those cables, there's a very good chance you get a nasty shock off it through induction from the aerial. And in fact, you can get really big, nasty shocks off them. Yeah, the same thing applies here. These cables, the anchored here, the bottom bit. Maybe there's going to be some here. But it's possible they can receive a voltage to reduction. This is now here with the cage. The latest system is from the Nozema for 1224, <coughs> where we had, how did you call it? It went up and threw the mass down. So this is yeah. in the cage here. Um, well, the last time I saw the communicator, it came down the outside. Yes, this is the no, this Yes, this, this, is, the this is the feeder. It goes up and top loaded mm. the mast, uh, which, is, no, which uh, is grounded here. It's an up and down. Mm. These, this is part of a, uh, a cage. There's one here. Yeah, oh, the, this, board, this, board. Is the, this mast is a tube, in fact. Mm. This is the mast. <laughs> this is something else. The, the mast is this tube, and there are three or four Four wires, four wires around, around going to the top. And we, we see the the, the, the cross bow, yeah. the cross bone on, on the top in the later photo. Uh -huh. yes, yes, there the cross bone. Yeah. There are four wires coming yeah. down. Yeah. And in fact, uh, when the communicator was working on twelve twenty four, it was uh, in the Isomere, not terribly, not terribly far from Amsterdam, and you could hear it mm -hmm. weekly in the middle of England. Mm -hmm. It uh, came through for. Uh, a quarter of the aerial, it came through quite well. This is a good aerial design, but it is a map, it is not a stable mast to go offshore. Yeah. No, but it yeah. never did go Absolutely offshore. Absolutely not. No, but yeah. this is this mast, I think it is. Another advantage, it was the, possible. It, another yeah. advantage was, was a ship was in the water. Ground. The water is a good earth. Mm -hmm. And this is, well, yes, again, you can see the cross. And this is probably one of the skirt wires. Mm. It's rather difficult to see. And the insulators, they are the is still porcelain or do yeah. they use other other uh, material with with uh, higher ductility because it is relatively uh, has no, no ductility porcelain. It can break, huh? Yeah, they are modern materials. I couldn't tell you exactly what they were, but a lot of people still swear for porcelain. But of course they're egg insulators, they're like this. Mm. They're looped so that if the insulator should break, the rope is still keeping. The cable is still keeping. And if you lose one or two, it's not the end of the world. And this is a curious photograph, there's a curious perspective. Yes, again, it's quite clear now. And again, you see the insulators here. 
in the stay wires, breaking up the stay wires, making them, as it were, invisible to the radio signal. Yeah, well, there's not much I can say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's more like a cage. Yeah, yeah like a, but then again, it's I'm not sure what down there. There's a cross up there. There's a cross up there, and I think this is possibly a mechanical construction, a kind of diamonds. Mm -hmm. Diamonds mm -hmm. to do. It's very difficult to see. I don't know how tall the mast was either. It's also very difficult to see from this photograph. Not fortunate the ship, but TV no longer exists. Oh, this is also a rocket beam. So you have this cubicle flat in amateur radio, so this is like such a uh, theory. Yeah, yeah. Which is, oh, this is also the theory. So no, this is the other King, King David of Israel, the, the British light yeah. vessel that was uh, equipped with transmitters from yeah. Germany and in a <laughs> special action in British Harbour, then they went off Israel and I think you, you have been there. Have you seen the, the ship mm. operating mm. or it's my picture. just it's your picture? Yeah. And it was on the air at that time, uh, but you had no chance to go on. Okay, come on. You didn't see what sort of area it was. Mm. Yeah. And again, it's not at all clear from the photograph. I'm tempted to think that this thing here has nothing to do with the medium wave area. I think that's probably simply support for an FM area. Mm. Or maybe a communication area, but I don't think it has any part to play. I w as a guess, I would say this was shunted from somewhere here up to about there. But a guess, but you can't see it from the front. Mm. Yeah, this is the Lassen Fair. Now, Lassen Fair, it's an interesting point because there were two stations on the Lassen yeah. Fair. So it could be. Well, this clearly is. Yeah. A sausage going up there, but it looks to me as if there's another one down there. Yeah. It's the key to, I was, I would think probably that if this was an area for one of the stations, and this one, let me see up there, there's an area for the other station. That is what I would think. Graham, you heard that? Graham, is Graham there? you have been on board? I've been following it from the studio. <laughs> Graham, you were on the Lasso Fair. Can you remember how the aerials worked? Uh, well, well. Let me think about it. You spoke into the microphone in the studio, and they said, "Hi, they're good people." I went up the top of my uh, oh, <laughs> It really <laughs> <laughs> so we know it worked. <laughs> yes, it worked very well. <laughs> a laissez fair. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, it was Radio England. I was on that. And um, <laughs> the old me amigo mask. Well, yeah, so this again was a very efficient mask because it was a very thin mask, kind of a pencil. And here, halfway up, it was cut in two, if you wish, and there was a coil put in there, and it's fed into that coil, yeah. a certain point of the coil, which means the two parts of the aerial being, were being fed this way. Mm -hmm. That was, in fact, a dipole aerial, a simple form of dipole aerial. Mm -hmm. And by all accounts, even with 10,000 watts, 10 kilowatts, it worked quite efficiently. Mm -hmm. So every construction has a limitation in the use of power. Every construction has its advantages and disadvantages. It's very, with, in a situation like this, it's very difficult to choose the best one. Certainly in those days, when nobody had been to see before with a high power transmitter. And something else we were talking about yesterday evening is that we still don't know why this piece at the top was crooked. It looks vertical there, but in fact it's leaning at an angle. <coughs> I can only assume that it probably got damaged in the storm. But you can see, by the way, there's plenty of insulators there. Yeah, you see that it's crooked at the top. I don't understand why. 
No, and, and when the Mi Amigo was broadcasting, I think with this mast on, on two frequencies, 389 and, and 259 and 73, mm -hmm. you use also the, the, the mast, the small mast of the stern? No, no, we no. First of all, it wasn't this mast at that time. It was this, no more this, this mast had been lost. We had a very strange construction. We had a, a boom at about this height. We had one sausage, if you like, going straight down to there. That was a vertical area. And the other one, the three, that was for 259. And for 389, we had a very strange thing coming out of here, starting with the coil, which somebody had wound around an oxygen cylinder. Mm. And then it went into here, where they had another coil, which used to go up and down like that in the storm. You can see the meters on the transmitter doing this. Mm. And then it went up to the top, came up to here, up to about here, we have flames all the time, lots and lots of flames, because lots of power coming up on the 259 aerial, lots of power coming up on the 389 aerial. They were both too short, the voltages at the top were enormous. And sometimes, if you had on both channels, a jump at the beat of the drum at the same time, bang, one of them will come down. <laughs> <laughs> and the strange thing was, the transmitter didn't usually trip out. You should have a funny smell and see the fish all laying on their backs around the water. <laughs> No, this, this is the, the last. telescope, the last mast. Yeah, yeah. it's the last mast, which is, uh, it was quite a good construction. It wasn't constructed strongly enough for a radio ship. We had some damage here. It broke here, we had to re-weld it. Then it broke there, we had to re-weld it. <coughs> then it broke there, we had to re-weld it. And eventually, we sent it all the way up to the top to repair the whole thing. And even when the ship went down, it stayed straight up yes. for about four years. I never liked the, I didn't like the way it looks, but it, it worked quite well. And may, although I mentioned that this piece at the top there was not built as top loading, it was built in those days for a dipole aerial. The newly folded unipole, we fed it with a cable from here, and it went up to the top there and back down again. And one morning after a very heavy storm, the mast had moved so much during the night that that cable was two meters longer. <laughs> <laughs> and the cable was hitting the, hitting, the, uh, hitting the mast. And I spent a while with, I think it was the cook, <laughs> one morning tying up the aerial, putting a tourniquet on it, making, it making the cable tight again because it was stretching. And, and, and that is why to this day, if you look at certain photographs, you can see that top piece is bent. And that's the reason why. Okay, here you have the stern top capacity. Yeah, yeah this is uh, from later on when that top piece had been removed and placed with a star. It would have been nicer to have had a larger star, but we'd learned from experience <coughs> before that a larger star used to move around so much, it got metal fatigue at this point. Mm -hmm. And then one evening I tried to switch the transmitter on and it wouldn't go on, because during the day, click, it had broken off there and this whole thing had gone overboard. And nobody had noticed. <laughs> the transmitter kept on. But when I switched it off at tea time, it would not go back on. So that meant retuning the mast in the stormy night. But we did it. Mm -hmm. Ah, this is of course the Mibo 2. It's very difficult to see. Again, that used to have a star at the top, mm -hmm. but the star has fallen off. Uh, and in fact, scarcely, you know, you can't see it on this photograph. It goes up there. It goes up there. From the top? Yeah, from, from this cage. Uh, oh, yes, you did. Yeah, sure. And the shortwave aerials? Oh, the shortwave, again, you can't, you scarcely see them, but they, these are V aerials. Yeah. Like, like, you can't see them really. For both, for 49 and 31. Yeah, but they were two. Yeah, again. Um, this is the feeding point. At the top, you can see the star. The feeding point, again, has that thickness. It's made thicker. It has to do with the uh, mm. with the uh, bandwidth. Mm. It was a very strong construction. Mm. Yes, again, that's quite clear. Mm. The feet, mm. not there. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a good, stable thing. Also, yeah. the stays were nearly 
vertical. Otherwise, you have the states always in a certain angle. But here, the states are nearly vertical, and even they are keeping the mass down, which is well, it could not be, usual. It could be, not, if, not you common. Have, if you would have put stays down to here and down to there, because the ship bends, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have worked anyway. It would be more likely to have pulled the mass down than hold it up. Because that ship did bend. Well, all ships bend, but that one particularly. Not but it was also with concrete at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Like the... Yeah. I would assume so, yes. yes. Uh, this is another, well, this is another way of feeding the aerial. Normally you have the feeder on the outside, but you can put it on the inside. And I would assume this one goes up to a certain height and then it, and then it spread out with a, with a three-way three splitter to feed the three sides of the mast. Probably the first system was the first mast on the Ross Revenge. Ah. <clears throat> and because it was such a high mast, I would assume that it, there were Insulators at various points up the mast to stop it from yeah. from being bent to the well from, from <laughs> touching <laughs> from touching, from touching the, the, the the mast when it has touching some, the metal work yeah. some bending yeah. yeah and they were probably being been enormous insulators um, yes well, this is a spider's whip uh, very strange looking thing it's uh, I'm not quite sure what to make of that. Uh, well, hmm. <laughs> very interesting. Well, this thing attracts my attention. It could be that it was fed to there. Hmm. Ah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, perhaps again, that was designed for a different frequency. I don't know. I've never seen this mast, unfortunately. I know the Ross Revenge, but not from this period. Um, there is a wire fix of that uh, bracket, but who's to know? In fact, that probably it's a few outside. Yeah. On the outside, yes. And if I look at it, it does in fact go to that thing up there. Maybe can this has to do with, with the V flexor. But that is also possible. That you are feeding when in different points. That's also possible. The yeah. Yeah. That's also possible. Yeah. And in fact, that is for all accounts a fairly, a relatively easy way of doing it. And I must say that Chicago showed enormous talent in doing that with limited equipment on board. Well, yeah, this is a... Uh... After the disaster uh, for the, of the big mast, uh, mm -hmm. it's a kind of tea area for uh, yeah. the same feeding point. Well, they, this, that, that bottle shaped thing in the middle is simply a large feed through aerial from the transmitter room, as indeed the smaller ones are. Um, it would look, in fact, as if here one aerial is going up this way. Uh, yeah, this was one, one, I don't know where the ship is there, on this photograph, but we see another, when they had the two aerials, for the RSL, the, R, the different heights, but this is still in the normal uh, 10 kilowatts, mm -hmm. the last configuration before well, again, the beaching. That's sort of a T aerial. It's uh, mm -hmm. sunk in a bit, but it's sort of a T aerial. And again, at this point, instead of doing what Veronica had, had, had done with a flat aerial, they made it more or less a box construction at the top. It comes down to the same thing, it doesn't really make much difference. <coughs> This is a photograph in, in the, during the RSL in South End. Mm -hmm. On top we have one uh, horizontal and uh, in two, two thirds height also because they, uh, uh, they, they would have to change the, the height of the aerial with the, with the tide to operate it was in the rules for the RSL to have the aerial not above a certain <laughs> level. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the the game was the tubes. If you take the Leuchtstoffröhre, you they are enlightened by the radiated power. Oh yes, yes. But uh, um, so this is always an effect of absorption of uh, yeah. radiated energy. Yeah. But uh, it is not really of any. No, you don't have to stand under an aerial mast if you walk under a high voltage power cable. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the voltage is in general, probably 600,000 volts. If you walk under a 600,000 volt cable mm -hmm. in the sky and hold of a fluorescent lamp, it will light then. If it doesn't light, there's no power in it. Mm -hmm. That's easy to see that. And it is independent of the frequency? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, more or less. And in fact, on a fluorescent tube with a modulated program, you can see the, you can see the, the, the lamp flickering with, the, with, a, with a time signal. You can see it flashing. It's uh, fun to watch. It's not much purpose in it, but it's fun to watch. <laughs> yeah, this is a fine example of a standard zero. It looks very, very short at the top. I think it's probably due to the angle of this photograph that. In fact, this is the working part of the aerial. The rest is just to, more or less to, to draw the signal up. Okay, thank you very much and vielen Dank an Peter Messingfeld für die Zusammenstellung dieser Bilder. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, for example, in Britain, uh, research was done about 15 years ago, into the influence of high, high voltage power cables. It seemed that some people who lived near high voltage power cables were getting horribly ill, even ending up in a roll stool, a rolling chair. And research was done, and there are indications that high voltage power lines can make some people very sick. And most people have no problem with them. It's, it's all a bit dubious, it's all a bit uncertain. But I will say one thing for myself, from my own experience. About five years ago I went to uh, Flavo Polder. There's a high power transmitter there from the Nozema, which is now on the air again for Radio Team. And we drove up, drove up to it in the car. The power they use I think is 400 kilowatts, which is a lot of power. And also it's a directional area, it's a kind of a figure of eight area. <laughs> You drive up and there are big, huge metal fences around it and you can stand up and look in front of the fence and that was looking up. A mast there and a mast there, no problem at all. And then suddenly I took three or four paces backwards so that I could look higher into the mast. And I got a feeling of somebody, somebody had put a big press on my head. Crunch! That's the way I felt and for the rest of the day I was sick. And I don't imagine that kind of thing. This was the first time you felt it physically. It was the first time I physically felt it, but it was the first time I'd been in the, in the proximity of so much power. It's a lot of power. 400 watts directional. Probably what I was receiving was almost a million. That's rather different from working with 100,000 or 50,000 on a ship. It's a very different affair. I don't think I imagined it, but the strange thing was, I was with a colleague and he felt nothing. But, uh, as you say, yeah. yeah. Maybe it does cost you your hair. <laughs> All right, can I go and have a beer now? <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah? Can I speak Deutsch? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. It's ganz einfach. Die, 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 diese Strahlung hängt ab von der Frequenz. Ja. Je höher die Frequenz, umso stärker ist die Strahlungsintensität. Das hat man ja auch äh, Mikrowellenzug. Uh, yeah? uh, frequency. High frequency. Yeah, mm. yeah. This is not quite right. Normally, you say the lower the frequency. Mm. 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 Mm.
Ja, du bist aber ein bisschen vorne. Ja, eh gleich haben wir nü. Also auf 70, <lacht> auf 70 cm merke ich so ab 10 Watt schon. Ja, yeah, well, the point is a very short gigahertz frequency can go through things. The low frequency, and the lower the frequency is, the further it will go, as a rule, along the ground. But we're talking about a very high frequency. A low frequency tends not to go through walls, not to go through steel doors. A gigahertz frequency can usually get through that. And maybe it can also get through into your head. But again, these are all things which are not, nobody really knows. So we try to play safe. But there is a lot of panic about aerials in many cases. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to